somewhere If you ever want to know a song that is my personal anthem, it's that song. Amen. Are you ready for the Word of God this morning? I'm going to ask you if you will once again. I'm going to, I'm going to get right into the Word of God. I'm going to watch the time. I'm going to hopefully... Uh, bring some uh, closure to, to this particular message that I started two weeks ago. Part three of a message simply entitled The Viper's Venom. Uh, so let me read to you some, the, the scripture, the foundational verse. And then we're going to get right into this section of script, or th- or this, this part of the message. Amen. As is our custom, I'm going to ask you once again, if you'd simply stand to your feet as we read in honor, reverence of the word of God. Just, just a few verses. You've heard them all before. Uh, just a few verses. And then I'm going to get right into this, into this message. From the book of Acts, chapter 28, verse 1, And when they had escaped, then they knew that, that, that they knew that island was called Malta. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, no unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us, everyone, because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Let's pray. Father, once again, we honor you and we magnify you. And we thank you for your presence even in this place by your spirit this morning. We thank you for the sweet spirit that you have invoked today among us. We honor you today as God. Spirit of the living God, once again, we're desperately in need of your presence, of your direction, of your words, of your leadership, of your guidance. Lead us in the ways of the Father that we may magnify the Son. To the Father be all the glory and all the praise as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. Once again, I began this message two weeks ago, and for the benefit of those that are listening and those that are here today, I'm going to continue to hopefully and prayerfully give you some direction from the Word of God. We, we know the account. We know what's, what's transpiring. We, we know what, what's happening in this portion of Scripture. So over the past couple of weeks, I've been sharing with you how the analogy that can be used or, or, or the, a metaphor that from, from this account in the Word of God is how it applies to us. I've often stated to you that, that if, if we do not benefit in a life applicable manner from the Word of God, then it becomes, in essence, literature to us. In, in other words, we can all pick up a book that will entertain us, but will not change us. <laughs> we know that the Word of God will change us. Amen? So I began to share with you some real life application. When situations occur in the reality of who we are, how it impacts us and what effect it has on us, and what do we do about that situation? Let, let me see if I, can, if I can get to a place where we can relate to that in our lives personally. Have you ever experienced an account that after the fact it left you different than how you were when it found you? A situation that occurred that, that, that because of its impact and, and how it resonated in your mind and in your life and in your heart, changed maybe the direction in which you were going or simply had an impact, an effect on you in a dramatic fashion. Life-changing application. A defining moment somewhere in your life. Most of us have experienced that in some way or another. And oftentimes it can be a number of different things. 
many, many times the situations that impact our, our emotion, how we respond to situations and what we do. And I use that once again because ultimately in, in this account, we see the, the, the imagery of what occurred that the moment that, that Paul re realized and recognized that this viper had, had, had grabbed a hold of him and fastened itself to him, what did he do? He shook it off. Well, once again, we can use that and, and, and say that something has happened in my life. And has anyone ever said that to you? Uh, I, I know that men have the tendency to do this to their sons. When their son or a little child <coughs> falls and, and maybe skins his knee, and, and maybe mothers say it too. Oh, come on now. <coughs> You're okay. Just shake it off. Have you ever said that? Have you ever heard that? Brother West, you're, you're laughing. I'm not sure if something has happened in that regard. Oh, oh just shake it off. Sometimes that happens, right? That, that's real life, right? I could say it this way uh, in our vernacular. That's real talk because it happens in life. Just shake it off. So we understand what it means and we understand what it is inferencing or what is in, it is inferring. But in the spiritual application, once again, that is something that we can do. In other words, if we use that to, 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 in, in the spiritual realm, what is it that we do to get that situation or that circumstance or that problem or whatever has, it occur, has occurred off of us? What can we do? What have we done? But then there's the other side. In the direction in which I have been going over the past couple of weeks, is it that oftentimes, just like in this manner, notice what happened. That, that when, when, when the people... Uh, this version is, is uh, the King James Version. It, it, it says, when Paul gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of, uh, out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffers uh, to not to live. And it goes on to say in verse 6, no, notice the response of these barbarians. They looked when they, howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and, and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God. They went from one extreme to another. Why? Because they, they, they knew the ramifications of what would occur when that venomous beast attached himself to a man. They, they knew what should happen. And so there were some expectations of what would occur. Now, now let, let's put it in the natural. Let, let's put it in our perspective. If someone is observing you and has witnessed a situation in your life, I can't help but wonder, are they watching you and I to see how we respond to that situation in our lives? Oftentimes that is what occurs. And let me just say this, as a man or a woman of God, there is a perspective that is rendered from others who are on the outside looking in. That even we, when we experience certain situations in life, the question is posed, well, what will they do? How they will, re will they respond? How will it impact them? And I simply say this because uh, it's just understood that these types of things occur in our lives now because of that situation they expected once again him to fall down uh, he should have swollen he should have died well this morning once again what I want to do is help you to understand the Word of God in such a way that when others anticipate this in our lives we can demonstrate to them through who we are as children of God that you and I shall yet live in the spiritual that's what I want you to see so as I, I was reading this and, and I was getting into this, I, I began to search the scriptures and I found Psalm 119. I'm not going to stay here very long, but if you ever have an opportunity to read Psalm 119, I would encourage you to do so. It is the longest psalm in the book of Psalms and the longest chapter of the Bible is Psalm 119. And in this, in this particular psalm, there are 176 verses in this Psalm 119. And, and, and this psalm, once again, being the longest psalm in the Word of God, uses for the Word of God different variations and different names. So this, this Psalm 119 
it will convey to us at least 156 times or words that give us the understanding of how important the Word of God should be in our lives. Once again, I, I want to encourage you at some time, just take the moment, take the time to read that. And what I want you to under, see and, and understand is, 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 is the importance of what the, the writer of Psalms, no one really knows who wrote Psalm 119. Some say uh, uh, David was the writer and others say uh, uh, other names. And, and, and there's no definitive way to determine who it was. But this is what I want you to, want you to see. That the writer had in mind of telling the readers the importance of God's ways and the scripture according to the word of God. And if I was to encapsulate to you the direction in which I'm going, I want to once again reaffirm and confirm that very thought. That whatever you and I need on this side of heaven to remedy circumstances in life can be found in the word of God. The Bible, once again, it, it, it's, it's been compared to a, a, a good medicine. We, we know that laughter is a good medicine. We've seen that in the Word of God. But the Word of God in and of itself is referred to like a spiritual medicine. And they're key words. Key words. Listen to these words. Some of these words. There's heart, ways, meditate, truth, path, understanding, salvation, freedom, hope, life, comfort, obey. Promises, knowledge, wisdom, light, joy, well-being, discernment, eternal, and peace. Just a few words that we will read in that particular psalm that help us to understand the importance of the Word of God. So, so with that thought, with that premise, with, 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 that, with that preface, I want you to understand that, that in order for you and I to move forward, where we are in the spiritual application personally, it must be predicated on understanding the importance of the Word of God in our lives individually now let me have let me give, give, give some examples Psalm 119 71 it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees Psalm 119 71 now I want you to notice the principle in that verse it was good for me to be afflicted most of us would not affirm that portion of scripture in our own mindset because this verse is basically basically saying and let me put it in, in, in layman's terms in our terms it was good for me to have that problem that issue that circumstance what, what, it was good that i was afflicted in the natural we say no 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 it, it is not good that i ever received that circumstance or that 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 diagnosis or whatever it was it was not good but here the writer says it was good for me that I might learn your decrees. It gives the idea that when we are afflicted as the people of God, when we are going through these situations, we search for responses. We search for answers. And this psalm once again gives us the inclination to understand that when we are afflicted, we can learn the spiritual truths from the decrees of the Word of God. You see it right here. All, all, once again, all over, all, all over uh, the Word of God. Numerous verses, numerous verses. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. That's verse 105. Uh, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Uh, verse 103. Verse, verse 165. Great peace have they, have they who love your law and nothing can make them stumble. Reiterating the importance of the word of God. Here's once, once, once again, uh, understanding these types of things. So, so, so here's what I'm trying to say to you this morning. Once bitten, the viper has attached, and you shake it off. That problem, that situation, that circumstance that keeps you in spiritual bondage, it is your and my responsibility to shake that thing off of our lives. Well, what is it that we do? How is it that we, how, how is it that we, we respond to that when now we are contending with the effects on our, on our lives? How it has impacted us. Uh, that offense, how it's making us feel and what we're making us think. All those situations, whatever it may be. But here's what, once again, what I wanted, I said to you last week. In order for you to be able to, 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 to triumph over that situation in your life, you first and foremost have to admit that there is a struggle. Then you identify it. I, I don't know if there's anyone here today that can identify some area in your life, whatever it may be, there might, there, there might be a spiritual struggle in your life. I don't know. 
maybe, maybe there's someone here. I, listen, I could say, that it is, could it be me? Yes, quite possibly it could be me. But how many of us would once again would acknowledge that somewhere in our innermost being that, we, that there is a battle that ensues somewhere in our lives? First and foremost, we have to admit that it's there. We have to confront the situation and then we have to do what it takes to get the victory. How many of us today, how many of you that will come to listen to this message are willing to do whatever you need to do in order to get victory in that situation in your life? Well, I said to you this morning, or last week rather, that it starts right here in John 3, and then I'm going to proceed. As Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. I use the comparison of, of what God told the people of, uh, of Israel to, to erect in the wilderness, uh, the viper on, on the pole, and how it was compared to seeing Jesus Christ lifted up on the cross. And now we come to that understanding that he that believeth, he that has faith, the implication, he that has a, a spiritual, especially in trust, their spiritual well-being to Christ. That is where it begins. In other words, people of God, if we have not yet, if that person has not yet entrusted their spiritual well-being to Jesus Christ, they are yet lost in a dying world, whoever it may be. Now, as we continue... I'm just going to get into some scripture and I'm going to use the time allotted and I'm going to go as far as I can go. So, so, so here you're going to hear the antidote for the viper's venom. Title of this message. For that person who in for whatever way or for whatever reason might be struggling on this side of life with something that either is just habitual, uh, an addiction, uh, whatever the case is, maybe, maybe the, the enemy has attached himself to you. And it's not yet been shaken off. May, may, maybe, maybe that circumstance that impacted your life in some way caused a negative effect that you've never gotten rid of. Only you know. But in the book of James, let me take you here. Because I want, you, I want to read to you a portion of scripture which at the very least has a five-fold demonstration of what you and I must do to overcome these types of situations on this side of heaven. And once again, if this does not apply to you in any way, well, praise God. But someone in this place needs to understand that in our spiritual journey, in our spiritual walk with Christ, for many people, it is a, it is a battle. A battle to overcome. A battle to be, vict be victorious. Why is it that even in the household of faith, there are people that will come and sit in the pews that are yet struggling with the issues in life? Because it is real. The reality is that most people will never admit to these situations in a public setting. Well, as I stated, I don't need to know. I don't need, listen, I don't need any person in this room to say, that is me. I have a problem and this is what my problem is. I don't need that to happen. But what I would, I do need is for you to determine and admit and acknowledge that it is there for you. For if you do not do this, then the word of God as described in Psalm 119 will never in any way apply in our, as, as being medicine into our lives, into our heart. So it's up to you. So once again, if there's an area that you can identify, whatever that case may be, this is what you need to do. This is what I need to do. James chapter 4. A very important portion of scripture is simply found in this. Let me read it to you. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and, the, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. A number of areas of, of, that, that are described here in this, in this portion of Scripture but I want to take you through this pro progressive method, this progressive area for that person who is struggling. For that person who the viper's venom is now, is now flowing through your, through your veins, spiritually speaking. And you know that it's you. Issues that you struggle with. Uncontrollable anger, frustration, disappointment. Whatever it may be, it can apply in this portion of Scripture. 
So what do you do? What do I have to do? What do we have to do? If that is you in any way, first and foremost, we already stated we have to believe and entrust our lives, our spiritual well-being to the person of Jesus Christ. That is, that is where it begins. That is simply where it starts. To that person who you know is once again struggling in any area of their life. Can we, as it's already been spoken, begin to evangelize and say to someone even today, you need Jesus. Because that's where it begins. But then, but then there's the responsibility of what do we do. You see, what has occurred to the detriment of the body of Christ in this generation is that it, is it spiritual leadership has given the impression that God will do anything for you that you need. And always puts the total responsibility on the miraculous ability of the God that we serve. Well, I don't believe that there is anyone here in this place that does not believe that we serve a miraculous God. I don't believe that there's anyone here that doubts the, 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 the ability of God to do whatever He desires to do. But let me ask you this question. What happens when it doesn't occur in that manner? What happens when you and I are waiting or anticipating for a miracle to occur and it doesn't happen? See, many of us find ourselves in that, in that situation. And have you ever been there before? Has it been ingrained in your mind that God is here to serve and to, to, to solve all of your issues and problems? But what happens when it seems as though the battles continue to ensue, no matter what we do? Here's what I want, to, I want to post to you once again. Now you've entrusted your life to Jesus Christ. Your salvation is assured through the Son of the living God. And I'd venture to say that we can identify ourselves this morning in that manner. How many of us today know beyond a shadow of a doubt, know that you know that you know that you are secure in your relationship with the Heavenly Father through the Heavenly Son? Anyone here? Most of us can say that is me. I know that I know that that is me. There's simply no doubt in my mind. But for that person, once again, let me show you. Here's what you do. Here's what I do. That problem, that struggle, that, 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 that battle, that addiction, that bondage, what, what, whatever it is, here it is. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Submit. Do you know how easy it is for us as humanity to yet desire to govern our actions and what we do? We are yet in control. The, the, the word submit is simply to accept or yield to a superior force or to the authority or will of another person. See, oftentimes we're so determined to control what happens in our life that in spite of claiming the label, in spite of everything that we do, we genuinely do not accept or yield to a superior force, that being the spirit of the living God. That we, once again, we, we yield to the authority or the will of the Heavenly Father in our life. So we're to submit. How many of us would find ourselves simply in a better place if we would simply submit to this premise, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. You see, do you understand that that is one of the, one of the best methods on this side of heaven to be, to be found in a place of security? Lord, let your will be done. It, with that frame of mind, we don't have to struggle with the idea of what should I pray for. Which, Lord, let your will be done. How many of us today are praying for the will of the Father to be done? Not my will, not my desires, not what I want, not what I even pray for, but the will of the Heavenly Father on this side of heaven. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. See, we govern our, 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 our lives, our emotional uh, well-being based upon events. What happens in our life? We often term it this way, what makes me happy? And I heard, I've heard it say, well, well, don't say happy in the realm of the Christian. Why? Because happiness is determined by happenings. To a certain degree, that's true. Because when things don't happen the way that we desire, oftentimes that is when it creates within us the negative emotion, the negative responses. But ultimately, we must understand this. Submit your will unto the will of God. Because once again, when we come with that perspective, then the onus is no longer on me trying to make it happen, 
trying to be certain that it does. Ultimately, Lord, let your will be done in this situation. And because of that simple submission, if it doesn't happen, my response is then, Lord, it must not have been your will in my life. Or there's another, there's something in accordance with the will of God will eventually manifest itself in my life. You have to believe that. So you submit. Now here's the thing. Remember the viper being the enemy, being the devil, using that analogy. Notice what it says here. Resist the devil and he will flee. Notice what it says. Resist. Resist. Do you know that even in the realm of your emotions, that the enemy is endeavoring or desiring to grab a hold and fasten himself onto even your emotions? Whatever it may be. How you respond to, to that situation. How you respond to that occurrence in your life. What do you do? And the moment that it happens in a way that is contrary to what we think when we have not yet submitted to the will of God, now the enemy begins to, once again, inject us with the venom of whatever it is will impact our lives in a way to destroy us spiritually. So you understand, in this verse, resist. Stand against that is opposed to resist to withstand. You see, what I'm trying to share with you is once again, real life application. That when something happens in your life and something occurs that maybe you did not expect and it begins to flow in the recesses of your thoughts and mind and control your joy, then you know what you must do in order to once again be certain that you yet remain in alignment with the will of God in your life. Here it says resist. What does that mean? When something happens in our life and, and, and we know and believe that it, it, it goes against our own intentions, our own desires, and, and we can see that the enemy is in desiring to use that to destroy us, then we have to stand in against and oppose that situation. How easy is it for us, once again, notice, notice, how easy would it be for us to simply acknowledge the adversity in our lives, the opposition, and remind the enemy, remind him that he will not grab a hold of us. Remind him that, that according to that situation in your life, he will not use that situation in order to take control of your mind. I have said this so many times. The enemy is out to control your mind. He's out to control your mind through your will, your thoughts, your emotions, your circumstances. And the moment it occurs and it goes outside of what you think should occur, then now he has a hold of you. So what do you do? You resist. You oppose. You withstand. And notice what it says. And he will flee from you. H have you ever been in a battle? And the moment you gain victory in that battle, it seemed as though all of a sudden the temptation was no longer there. H have you ever been there? I don't know if there's anyone here. that ha Is there anyone that has ever gained victory in any situation in your life? Well, I'm here to tell you when that happens, when, when you're willing to display to your adversary that you are not in this to lose, that you're in this to win in the kingdom of God, that I'm here to tell you that there comes a time that the enemy will recognize that he's in for a battle. What happens when we don't fight spiritually? Then I'm here to tell you it is those people, those Christians in the Christian realm that do not resist all of these things, all, the, all of the opposition that find themselves being defeated even in the household of faith. Why is it that, that there are the, the pews, empty pews from people that once said, I used to believe. I used to go to church. I used to pray. I used to do. I, I used to. But now nowhere to be seen. Why? Because in the battles of life, they did not resist. They did not fight. They did not, get, they did not control uh, uh, the forces that were coming against them and fight against the opposition. But this is real life. And this is what I want you to understand. That you and I, once again, the moment we leave this place, you and I will find ourselves in these types of situations. And for someone, it might not be anything extreme. As I stated, it could be, it could be something that simply takes control of that one area of weakness in your life. That one thing that, will, that he will be able to control your actions and what you do. 
So what do we do now? Now, now we submit ourselves therefore to God. We resist the devil, and the Bible says that he will flee. Now let me let me let me give you this caveat: that just because that he, the devil will flee from you, it does not mean that he will not return. Are you listening to me? You see, a war is made up of numerous battles. Your spiritual journey is a spiritual war. That circumstance is a battle. But if you can win that battle, here's what can happen. All of a sudden now, your faith will increase. You begin to believe on the Word of God. You begin to believe on the promises of God. And then you begin to be convinced that if you won that battle and that enemy did not defeat you in that battle, that soon when the next battle comes, in that same manner, you can win that battle. And ultimately, and against the spiritual warfare, you can win the war that is opposed to your very spiritual existence. We all find ourselves there. Every one of us will find ourselves there. But how, how, how do we maintain that? How do we maintain the integrity of, 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 once again, making it through these situations? Well, you submit, you resist, and now you draw nigh unto God. You draw nigh, nigh unto God. Now, 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 once again, I want you to see how, how, how these portions of Scripture, how there is a condition and there is a response. Draw nigh to God. Well, if I was to ask you this question, how is it that you and I can draw nigh to God? What would you say? How is it that you draw? Is there anyone here that says, I know how this is how I draw nigh to God. Is there anyone here that knows a manner in which you may personally draw nigh unto God? Well, you know what that could be for you. But here's the, here, here, here's the importance of the matter. Our relationship with the living God must be the most important relationship that we have on this side of heaven. I'm talking about any relationship. It's your relationship with the living God through the living Son, through the living Holy Spirit. It must be paramount in our lives. For if it is not, then you and I can succumb to these very things that we are talking about even today. So we draw nigh unto God. What is it that you and I do to draw nigh? What is it that you do in any earthly relationship to draw nigh? There must be intimacy. There must be fellowship. There must be time. One of the greatest important elements of, of drawing nigh unto God is giving your God, your Savior, your time. I've said to you over the past couple of weeks, so many times on this side of heaven, we're distracted by life. And I've made innuendos of how you and I can be distracted even by, by all these little ways in, 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 in our earthly existence. And it's true. Because I'd venture to say, if I, if I was to ask this question, which do you read more? Your, 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 the phone in your hand or the Word of God? Most of us would acknowledge that answer without even responding. And that is simply just the truth. So at some point in time, people of God, you and I, must do what is necessary to draw nearer unto the God that we serve. And that's something that you and I have to do individually and have to do personally. I, I, I read what comes to my mind now, now is, is, is uh, describing uh, King David and how he was referred to as the man after God's own heart. Well, you know that, that the King David did not become a man, a man after God's own heart by simply osmosis. There was a reason why he became known as that man after God's own heart. Because there are numerous times in his existence that he spent time alone with the God that he served. Worshipping, singing, writing psalms about the Lord that he served. How many of us today, once again, draw near unto the God that we serve? I'm simply trying to give you an elementary basic understanding of how you and I can overcome all of these things in the Word of God that describe or describe to defeat the people of God. To draw near, to draw nigh, to make near. That is to approach, to be at hand, to draw. That conveys the idea that it is you and I that must do these things. Do you want me to help you to understand that one of the reasons why today, even in the body of Christ, 
there are many that are yet, 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 yet controlled by the yoke of bondage on, the side of li- on this side of life is because we refuse to draw near unto our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the way that it's intended to happen. I know no one's going to shout me down, but that is simply the truth. Why, why is it? Why is it that they Why is the truth? Because there's something that happens when we draw nigh unto God. When I invest my time, when I pray, I, I shared with someone this morning, there are, there are times when, when I, I'm going about my day and I'm just simply singing to myself, singing unto the Lord in my own personal time, in my own personal worship. No one else is around. I don't have to prove to anyone what I am doing. But in that moment of solitude, I'm there in fellowship, in communion, in union, drawing nigh unto the God that I serve. So what you see and experience on Sunday morning is just an overflow of my relationship and what I am doing throughout the week. Because I never want to come here not filled with His presence and His Spirit. But I draw nigh. I draw nigh. And here's the response. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Are you listening to me? Problems, troubles, trials, loss, whatever it is, loneliness, aloneness. And the Word of God says, draw nigh unto me, says the Lord. And when you do this, I will draw nigh unto you. The God of the universe saying to you and to me, I will draw nigh unto you. You're never alone. We're never alone. Notice what he says. But now, now I, I see this in, the, in, this, in this area of scripture. And I see this area that, once again, there's this cooperative effort. Because notice, notice, notice what it says here. Draw nigh, and he will draw nigh unto you. Now, notice what he says. Cleanse your hands. H- had a great account, a testimony yesterday, of Brother Larry and what he experienced at one point in his life. Going to the doctor, because, or, or, or I, I know I'm not going to say it correctly, feeling as though something was wrong because his hands were blue. Going to the doctor trying to find out what's wrong with my hands. And and ultimately realizing that he had been wearing a pair of new blue jeans. And you know what happens with those new blue jeans. That blue tends to transfer to other things. So somewhere along the line, maybe he was doing this, which caused his hands to turn blue. Literally. But it was not a debilitating disease. It was simply the ink or the dye from his genes. And what was he told? What was his antidote? What was his remedy? Go wash your hands. And I know that it, that, that, that account, it falls right here perfectly without me even thinking about it until just now. But here's what it is. It's the spiritual application is cleanse. Cleanse your hands. Your hands is, 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 is a metaphor for your actions and what we do. So, so now, once again, we submit, we resist, we draw. Now cleanse your hands. What is it that we do that puts us in this position to be yet in bondage or, or in all these negative affirmations of who we are as children of God? It's our hands. It's our hands that turn on that television, that channel. It's our hands that push that inappropriate button. It's our hands. It doesn't matter what it represents or what it does. The inference is cleanse your hands. It is time for us as the people of God to determine, I will no longer do this in my life. For there is the remedy. But but notice what he said. Notice what he said. Listen, James, believed to be the brother of Jesus Christ, he pulls no punches. Notice what he says, cleanse your hands. And he doesn't say, you brethren. He he doesn't say, you cleanse your hands, you beloved. No, no, no. He says, cleanse your hands, 
And what does he say? Ye sinners. You see, at some point in our Christian existence, we must not be intimidated to share the truth with people. In other words, if we simply make everyone feel good about their presence or make them appease them based upon, oh, they will never come back, I'm going to say to you this, that then we take away the very, the very element that the Holy Spirit uses in a person's life to bring conviction, to bring change. So he says this, cleanse your hands, you sinners. He, he didn't say saints. He's conveying the idea, if that is you, if that is what you do, and you're getting bondage, and you want deliverance, and there's no, no victory, and there's no, 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 you're not overcoming that battle, then it's time for you and I to cleanse our hands and do things differently. I should have named this, this, this message today, don't shout me down. Because there are times when we hear these types of things that there's very little response. But I've been inclined to believe that it is these types of situations and scriptures that reveal to us the importance of abiding by these scriptural references in our lives. Notice what he says. He, 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 he's not just saying this to just, just say. He, he's conveying the idea that those that are devoted to sin are not free from sin. They are preeminently sinful, especially wicked, all wicked men, specifically of men stained with certain definitive vices or crimes. That is his definition. Listen, as people of God, there might be times that every now, now and then we miss the mark of God and we sin. We fall out of the, of the will of God. But aren't you grateful today that the Word of God conveys the idea that for that person, if you confess that sin, that God is faithful and just to forgive you of that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Aren't you grateful? Come on, come on. I don't know if there's anyone here, that, but I, I'm so grateful that I can take that verse and say that it applies to me. But I'm also here to tell you that does not give us the license to continue in habitual lifestyle to sin in accordance with this word. So, so we must understand that. We must, we must listen. If I, if I want to genuinely be a man of God, to be used of God, then I must represent the God I serve in a manner of high integrity for His glory. And that's just not me. That's every one of us. That's every one of us who desires a higher purpose in the things of God. I, I know, I know, I've come to the realization that, I, that there are those who say, well, Pastor David, you're a pastor. You're a minister. You should be that way. But I'm not. But do you understand, people of God, the standard of God applies to us all. Every one of us. And if I don't at the very least bring this to our attention, then I am doing us a disservice and I am not fulfilling my purpose of my calling in our lives. He, he, he goes on to say this. Purify your hearts. Purify. It's re recognizing the idea that, that, once again, that, that, is, not, that is not simply saying that, that, that you're going to be perfect from this day forth. What that is saying is get rid of those things that would keep you in bondage. He doesn't say, listen, have you noticed that he doesn't say that this is what God will do? That this is what the Holy Spirit will do? You notice that he doesn't say that. Because all around the Word of God, the principle in the Word of God is that there must be a cooperative effort between what we know is true and what we do with what we know is true. I heard the word wisdom on a few occasions this morning. Wisdom. And then the simplistic definition of this word wisdom is this. The root meaning of that word is found in the word knowledge. So in other words, without knowledge, you likely will not have wisdom. But when you have knowledge, wisdom becomes what you know you must do with the knowledge that you possess. That's wisdom. Why is it that young people very seldom have a high level of wisdom? Come on, I'll help this life applicable to me. Because for many of them, the knowledge of life application has not taken hold. How many would say, as you've grown older, 
you have grown wiser. Come on now. Most of us, because why? Because we have gained knowledge of certain areas of our life. And wisdom says, now that you know, now you know what to do and not to do. So he, he, he once again continues to, to, to give us, give, give us that, 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 that perspective in our lives. But he goes on to say, purify your hearts. In, in other words, no longer is it a matter of what God does for us. But rather, in essence, what we are willing to do for the cause of our God. Purify. Over and over and over again in the Word of God, they purified the temple of God. They purified this. They, they, they took out the old and brought in the new. They got rid of what should not be there and replaced it with things that needed to be there. Purify. Purify. Let me, can, can I just get personal? Can I, can, I get a, can, I get, can, can I be a pastor right now? And let me ask you this question. How many of us can identify something in our lives that we, it would be incumbent upon ourselves to purify ourselves from that situation in our lives? Once again, trust me, I'm not going to ask you, you. You don't have to shout me down. You don't have to tell me what it is. But how many would, would acknowledge acknowledge? That that, must, that needs to be me. To take it out. To get rid of it. To get, listen what it says. Listen, listen what it says. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Do you know that that, that is one of, the, one, one of the greatest negative connotations in the Word of God for the believer? To be double-minded. In other words, one day I'm going to serve God. But this time I'm going to serve men. This time I'm going to serve God. This time I'm going to serve my flesh. That is being double-minded. And the Word of God uses that reference as a person who basically vacillates back and forth as being double-minded. The intention of the Spirit of God is that when you and I come to saving relationship with the living God, that we once again submit everything that we are to His Lordship in our lives. That we submit, that we resist, that we draw nigh, that we cleanse our, ha our hands, and that we purify our hearts, that we may not be double-minded. I wonder how many of us in this place have a genuine desire to say, I want to serve my King in a manner that will honor Him on this side of heaven. How many, does that apply to anyone in this room today? So this is what we do. Notice what he says. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Be afflicted and mourn. Listen, there comes a time when we must acknowledge that the, 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 the words of God, that the, 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 the principles of, of God are in our best interest. And we see it over and over and over in the word of God. So let me give you, let me give you what I'm trying to, to share with you this morning. And I'm going to go through this real quickly for the sake of time. Because this morning I'm speaking to that person who is serious I'm talking about serious about their Christian journey, where they are as a man, as a woman of God. And share with you, according to the Word of God, the importance of the Word of God and how it helps us through these areas of our lives. All these directions of what we're to do and how we're to respond. And I want you to see and understand that in the natural, I said this to you last week, in the natural, the antidote is referred to as anti-venom. It's, it's a, the natural connotation. That's what, that which will conquer the viper's venom. Well, the spiritual application, once again, it, according to what I'm trying to say to you, is to give you the Word of God in such a way that will counteract whatever the enemy is endeavoring to thrust in your mind. I don't, does, does this interest anyone in this place today? Let me help you to see, and then I'm going to be done. Because once again, I did not make it very far. Let me give you some areas of scripture that I want you to see. In the area of distraction, and life is controlling you by life and situations. Let me give you the, 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 the anti-venom to that distraction or distraction in our lives. Here it is. It's found in Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first. How many of us are being distracted today? Listen, are, are you being, listen, I'm being distracted in so many different ways. 
But what I must keep paramount in my mind is seek ye first the kingdom of God. What does that say? That the kingdom of God is paramount in your life. It's the most important area of your Christian existence. I'm not talking about distraction. I'm talking about putting Jesus first in our lives. When Listen, I'm not just talking about when we come into the building. I'm referring to and talking about when we leave this place even today, Jesus is yet paramount in our lives. Because that is where it begins. But I'm here to tell you that is also where it ends. It begins with Jesus. He's the Alpha. And it ends with Jesus. He is the Omega. Apart from seeking the kingdom of God first and allowing Jesus to be paramount and preeminent in our lives, you and I, I'm here to tell you, the enemy is searching. Do you know that he is subtle and he is cunning? Do you know, once again, listen, when a viper attacks you, he very seldom will come out in the open and find and come searching for you. Very seldom. What happens when you're least expecting it? When you didn't see it, when you weren't looking for it, and all of a sudden he recognized you as a vulnerable victim to be attached to and inject you with this type of spiritual venom. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't recognize it now, I'm here to tell you that is your story. The enemy is endeavoring to do that very thing to every person in this place today. So what do we do? Yes, we shake it off. But now what? I have so much more here. Oh, oh, let me just go down. What about that person who believes that one of the greatest lies of the enemy is to inject us with the venom of you will always have more time. Do you know that's applicable? I'm not going to surrender today because I know that I have more time. I'm too young right now. There's so much more that I need to do. I have more time. And the enemy convinces us that we have more time. Well, I'm just, can I just make this? Can I interject? Brother Marshall, can I interject this portion from yesterday? To bring it real? Because there are times when we do not know that we have more time. Let me get real. I had no idea that I would experience the emotions of this week. But I did. I had no idea. And the moment that I got that phone call to tell me what had, this, what had occurred, I responded in the natural. But I responded internally. And my internal response was a true indication of my initial emotion. And it was intense. Because I thought that we had more time. I believed that we had more time. And at that moment in time, when, I, when it came to my, the, the realization of what I'm hearing, I said, no, this can't be real. I'm, I'm not hearing what I'm hearing. This, no, no, no. Am I dreaming? This is not really happening. No, this is not happening. But it happened. We thought we had more time. But at that very moment in time, everything changed. I have more, but I'm going to stop right here, and I don't know what I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to come back, I, I don't know. Over and over and over again, I can give you the Word of God to help you remedy these areas of scri uh, in your life, worry, doubt, and fear. If, if that is you, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Oh, numerous, numerous verses in Scripture.